So let's all look forward to 2021 and hopefully we can have some social events and to celebrate, let's all build an ant weight combat robot. And no, this is obviously not a complete combat robot, but if you're new to the hobby, it's an important first step. So welcome everybody, I'm Jason, the creator of Team Rocco Robotics and the creator of Micro Flash Delta, my three pound combat robot. And today I thought I would start on a new series here where I'm building my very first ant weight combat robot. This is going to be a one pound robot, obviously a long way to go, but I'll explain what this is in just a moment. But for the first video, what I want to do is define the parameters of the robot. And what I mean by that is kind of take what's in your head and get it down in a form to where you can actually build a design off of. So, all right, let's get started with that. So the first step here is really just to create some sort of sketch of what your robot is. Because right now, if you got some idea in your head, you need to get it down in a form to where you can at least identify what the major features of it are. And that's what I'm doing right now. Now the sketch doesn't have to be pretty. It can be pretty ugly. It doesn't have to be a 3D sketch. It can be some sort of 2D thing. But you want to be able to have it laid out to where you know, at least in a very broad sense, what you're building. So what your goal here is kind of to create your dream robot. Now the final project might not actually end up looking like this, but this needs to be a starting point to where you can work forward to in a future design. And so I'm identifying things like the four wheel drive system, talking about how I'm thinking I'm gonna make the chassis mostly 3D printed, probably some variation of nylon. I got a little bit of UHMW armor around the edges, and then I've gotta have some sort of system running down the middle that kind of supports the entire robot, and in particular supports the weapon which at this point I'm looking towards two kind of single tooth disc type weapons. You know, like I said though, it's this is sort of like my initial thoughts as to what I want to try to do. I'll figure out all the details later on when I get to the design, that'll be in a future video. So let me just talk about a few key things to be thinking of as you're sketching out your robot here. One big one for the insect class robots, whether that's ant weights or beetle weights, is you really want some sort of wheel guards, some sort of armor that protects the wheels from getting ripped off. Now, if you've watched BattleBots before, you know that the full size 250 pound guys, a lot of them don't have wheel guards, and there's very good reasons for that. However, those reasons, which generally have to do with the material of the wheel guards, the material of the wheels themselves, and the skill of the driver, don't really apply to either A, the insect weight class, or to you as a new robot builder, because it takes a while to learn how to drive these things. They're very, very finicky. <laughs> so I highly recommend that your insect class robots have some sort of wheel guard, UHMW, 3D printed nylon. It all works pretty well. The second thing you need to be thinking about is the center of gravity. Now, I don't know if you kids these days have like seesaws. I mean, we had those when I was growing up. They're playground toys where people sat on either end. You kind of balance the other out. They're very dangerous. I wouldn't be surprised if they haven't been in a playground in a long time. But the idea is you need to figure out where your robot's balance point is from front to back. Now, in general, left or right, robots are relatively symmetrical. Unless you have components distributed out in a weird way, there's not going to be a lot of weight distribution left or right. But front to back, it really matters. And you want that center point. So if you were to imagine here, if you hold your robot up and I was able to balance it at a single point, you, what you would want is that balance point to be somewhere as close as possible to the drive wheels. That's going to give you the best amount of traction. Now the one thing to think about here is if you have four wheel drive, you want that balance point to be somewhere in the center of all four wheels. And also if you've got a control robot, say like a lifter arm or something like that where you pick up and, and manipulate the enemy robot, you kind of need to think about how that works in regards to your center of gravity because now you can have another one pound chunk of mass somewhere on your robot. Now let's talk about components. At this point you do got to make a few choices but I'll try to make it relatively simple for you and just kind of give you maybe two choices for each category. Now let's take a look at your options for motors. First up are what I'm going to be using which are 16 millimeter gear motors from Bot Kits. These are the battle hardened versions that come in their Candy Wasp Antweight Robot Kit. Another but 
Alternatively, there's another popular version of a drive motor out there for ant weights, and it's the one that comes in the Viper Combat Robot Kit by Fingertech Robotics. And now what I'm about to show you here is the non-combat robot version of those motors. These here are called Gold Sparks, but what you want to use for combat robotics are Silver Sparks. And they're a similar kind of class of motors, another excellent choice for combat robots in the ant weight class. Now these are both brushed motors, which at the time that I'm recording this are kind of an easier way to get into combat robotics. Brushless motors work great for weapons, and if you really want to tinker, you can make them work for drive, but for your first robot, I would say go with brushed motors. Related to drive motors is going to be your wheel options. Now for the Bot Kit 16mm gear motors, you can get them in two different versions. One actually uses their Candy Wasp hub system, which I'm going to drop a whole bunch of pieces out here for that. I think that's all of them for the hubs. <laughs> There's a lot of parts to them. And I'm going to try to use those first, though these are an inch and a half diameter wheels. They're kind of small. We'll see how things work. Alternatively, you can get a version of these motors that work with the BaneBot system, which conveniently the Fingertech Robotics motors also work with BaneBots, and that's a separate type of wheel system. There's really even a few more wheel systems out there that can work for ant weights. They're all roughly going to work well enough for you. Just kind of choose whichever one works with your motors. So also related to motors is going to be your electronic speed controller options. Now this, once again, I'll give you two options for that. First up is going to be the Scorpion Mini electronic speed controller that's sold by Bot Kits. And conveniently, it's the recommended speed controller for their 16 millimeter DC gear motors. Alternatively, if you want something that's a little bit lighter weight, you've got the Fingertech Tiny ESCs, which conveniently, once again, are designed to work with both their Gold Spark and more importantly, the Silver Spark Combat Robot Motors. Now there are three main differences between these two options for electronic speed controllers. First, with the Scorpion Mini, this is a two-channel controller, which basically means you control both your left and right side of your drive motors with one board. Whereas with the tiny ESCs, you're going to need one per side of your robot, so you're going to need two of those. The second difference is going to be the weight. Now, according to bot kits, this guy clocks in at 17 grams installed. And then for the tiny ESCs, they clock in at around 4 grams. So they are going to be a little bit lighter to use those, which I may end up doing come production time. Because the Scorpion Mini here, I actually use this guy inside a Microflash Delta, my 3-pound combat robot. And I'm just going to use one of these for now because I have a few extra laying around. Now, if you obviously want to go for as lightweight as possible, the tiny ESCs are going to be a little bit better option in that regard. Which brings me to the third and final difference, which is how much current they can handle. The Scorpion Mini ESCs can roughly handle about twice the current of the tiny ESCs. So, when that comes to your drive motor, it means this guy here can handle the Fingertech Silver Sparks and Gold Sparks pretty well. Now with these guys right here, this DC gear motors from Bot Kits, I can't actually find the amount of current they draw. So I honestly don't know if you can use these with the tiny ESC without damaging them. It's quite possible that because the Candy Wasp kit has four motors in it, that two of these per side may take out a tiny ESC, but because the Scorpion Mini can handle twice the current, it's all right. I'm not really sure. but. It's just important to know that going into choosing your electronic speed controller. For the power switch, we're going to make this simple. A Fingertech mini power switch and long arm 332nd hex wrench. This little switch here will work great for ant weights and beetle weights. I use one on Micro Flash Delta and it works fine and plenty of other people use it as well. It's basically got a little bit of a hex bolt in there or something, and you use the hex wrench to turn your robot on or off. It's a great secure way to make sure your robot can be turned on and off easily, but not so easily that you'll get knocked out in combat because it gets turned off. For the next item, you might have to buy something right now because we're talking about the battery. Um, at this point in the stage of your build process, you don't really know what kind of battery you want to use. I've got one here that's an old Microflash Delta 3S battery. This sucker is overkill for an ant weight. But for right now, until I figure out how the weight plays out and what final battery I want, 
I'm just gonna use this for testing purposes. So if you don't have a battery, you're gonna wanna buy one that works with your drive motors, the 16 millimeter gear motors from Bot Kits. Use a 3S battery. The Fingertech Robotics are a little more happier at 2S, but they probably can be pushed to 3S with the risk of damaging them. Either way, if you wanna just take a crapshoot with an Antway battery, probably 250 to 400 milliamp hours is good, but like I said, it's kind of a crapshoot. So just pick something that doesn't work, like what batteries are cheap. For the last few items, I'm not gonna recommend you buy anything yet, but I'm gonna give you some basic dimensions. So when we build this guy right here, which is your crappy test platform, you have something you can put in place of them to figure out what their approximate size is gonna be. So for your weapon motor, if you block something out that's about a cylinder, it's about an inch diameter and an inch long, that'll probably give you a pretty good idea of how much space that that component is gonna take up when you get to the final choice. Next up here, we have your receiver. Now I recommend for you right now, for your receiver, just use whatever comes with your radio. We'll talk about the radio in just a moment. This guy right here is basically just a placeholder to figure out how big things need to be. And this is the brushless speed controller for my weapon. So this thing here is about an inch by about a half an inch by maybe about, so let's say a quarter an inch tall. So if you kind of find something that's about those dimensions and just stick it down on this board for now, that'll give you an idea of how much space the final brushless ESC for the weapon is gonna require. All right, the last thing we need to talk about is your radio. When it comes to choosing a radio, you have to ask the question right now, how committed are you to this hobby? There are cheap options and there are expensive options. <laughs> and frankly, if you're really serious about combat robots and you really think it's something you're gonna do a lot, it is worth spending the extra money to get a nice radio right now. This guy right here is a six channel Spectrum radio. It's one of the more expensive options for six channels. Spectrum is one of the nicest brands out there. So why would I choose a more expensive radio over a cheaper radio? First of all, channels. Channels are how many basic commands you can send to the robot at once. At a bare minimum, you need four for a combat robot. You're gonna drive with these two over here. And then most likely this throttle stick right here is gonna control the speed of your weapon. However, with six channels, two of these will let me send additional commands that I can kind of flip and maybe I want to shut down the robot remotely, which is often a requirement for larger robots. So a six channel radio can let you grow with a hobby where a four channel cannot. Now this guy here, in addition to having six channels, has a bit of computer programming to it because obviously I've got a lot more little um, knobs here than obviously two additional for the four main channels here. And an advantage of combat robots is you can program those to do other interesting stuff with how your radio is set up. So in particular with Microflash Delta, while this controls the velocity of the weapon, this switch right down here that I'm toggling is a safety override. So if I had the switch set like that, the weapon will not activate and that's done at the radial level. It's not something being done in the robot. So I'm able to use this extra switch here to give me a little bit of extra safety control over my robot's weapon. And so that's a good option you're gonna get when we have more complex programmable radios. Like I mentioned a little bit ago, whatever radio you buy, it almost certainly will come with a receiver, but just make sure it does. And at this point, you should only be using 2.4 gigahertz radios. If you find any old AM, FM, or PCM radios, those are old school technology, talking like early combat robot day stuff, don't go with any of those. So now at this point, hopefully you've kind of somehow magically ordered all your parts in about two minutes, and you've got them in front of you, hey. If not, honestly, oh, I guess I could tell you to pause the video and come back in a few days when things have been ordered. <laughs> YouTube doesn't like that though. But what we're gonna do at this point is let's bring out this thing I showed off at the start of the video. I call this thing a functional sketch, right? All it is is all my components zip tied to a piece of foam core board. And the main goal here in terms of the defining parameters process is to try to get a realistic size of your final robot in your head. And that's what this is for. So you wanna just kind of lay out your components more or less how they should be laid out. And then I'm actually wiring them all up 
to the where it's actually a functional robot here. You'll see me driving this thing around in a moment. And that way, just kind of like I said, it gives you a nice defined idea of just how big your final robot's gonna be in your head. Because some of the things, like for example, in particular the wires, for example, it's tough to really visualize how much space that really takes up. So therefore, if you dive right into a CAD modeling, you could very easily find yourself running out of space in your robot because you kind of think, oh, wiring doesn't take up much space, but it really does. So this kind of setup here just helps, gives you the total size of your robot in your head first, which you can then take on to the design process. So in terms of wiring this thing up, it's actually fairly simple for the electronics of a combat robot to be assembled. Most things will come with instructions. For example, I'm going to pull out here the instructions that come with the Scorpion Mini ESC. They actually give you a really nice, very simple wiring diagram. Um, alternatively, other ESCs like the Tiny ESC, you can find a wiring diagram on their website. And I will also link to several videos below of other builders who have done kind of the detailed process of putting all electronics together in case you want to follow along step by step with a video. Now the one thing nice about insect class robots is when building these functional sketches, zip ties will work good enough for holding things down, where if you go to a bigger scale, you really need real components to hold everything in place. The other thing that I'm doing here is I'm building a very crappy stand-in, I mean it's with foam core board, for approximately where I think the weapon's going to be, just to get an idea of how that might fit in the eventual design. So I would recommend doing something like that. However, of course, don't try to make the weapon functional. Just kind of make it a placeholder for now, just so you're thinking about whereabouts it might go in the robot. And there you go. Look at that performance. <laughs> like I said, this is just like a functional sketch, and it basically has the performance and handling of a rusty shopping cart. But you know what? We can worry about those issues in the final design and testing and refinement process. Right now, it's all about just getting the basic understanding of the electronics of the robot and how everything goes together. And like I said, getting the rough size of things. All right, well, that brings us to the end of today's video. In the next episode, I'm going to take this little functional sketch I call here along with the sketch of my robot and we'll turn it into a more formalized design so we can actually begin building something that kind of has some performance to it instead of, you know... <laughs> Hey. Anyway, so thank you guys all for watching. Once again, I'm Jason, the creator of Team Rocket Robotics. If you want to see the more episodes in this series, go ahead and hit subscribe. They'll be coming out over the next few months probably. In the meantime, we got more Battletech for sci-fi combat robot stuff to talk about and probably some other projects tossed in here and there. I'm not entirely sure at this moment, but all right guys, we'll have a happy new year and we'll see you in 2021.